they are available to you. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about ancient Greece. We're going to be talking about the geometric or orientalizing and archaic periods. This is a culture that has been studied every which way, okay? And every aspect of this culture has been analyzed and has been divided by scholars into various eras, uh, such as uh, these terms that we're looking at now, geometric, orientalizing, and archaic. Basically, in contrast to the civilizations of ancient Egypt uh, and the ancient Near East, Greek society is going to focus on the individual person. Uh, they are going to focus uh, so much so that the kind of adage associated with the classical world is, and the Greek classical world, is that man is the measure of all things. For the first time, we are going to see a worldview in which the greater predominance is given to human beings over that of the magical or animal worlds. We're going to see that this is going to have a profound impact on the development of this culture. We are going to see that their religion is going to reflect this human-centered understanding of the world. The gods of the ancient Greeks are going to be basically superhumans, uh, taking physical human form, not composite creatures, not animals. Uh, and they are going to have the same kind of human foibles that we have. We are also going to see the rise of a new governmental system, which is going to reflect the um, belief in the individual and their ability to make decisions for themselves. And this is, of course, Athenian democracy that is going to emerge in the 5th century BCE. Uh, this idea that man can govern himself uh, is going to replace uh, the kind of autocratic uh, kingship that we see in the Near Eastern uh, and Egyptian culture. Not surprising, this new kind of society is going to require uh, a new kind of art. We're going to see one that is going to be centered on the material world, the world in which we experience now. Uh, this uh, work is going to reflect the philosopher's search for human values, truths, and an idea of human harmony. Uh, we're going to see it in the sculpture painting that is produced, as well as perhaps best articulated in the architecture of the ancient Greeks. Um, for the Greeks, humanity is what matter, and humans, as I say, were the measure of all things. This is called a humanistic worldview, okay? Humanistic worldview. Um, and uh, we're going to see this uh, is going to emerge around uh, the 8th century BCE when the Greek city-states are going to begin their history. They begin it with the first Olympiad, which happens in 1776 BCE, um, kind of fittingly as we prepare for our own Olympiad in uh, just a couple weeks. Uh, as we already know, uh, in the ancient Aegean culture, the Mycenaeans experienced, uh, basically, uh, were overtaken by the mysterious sea people in 1100. This is going to throw this area of the world into a dark age, which is going to last about 500 years, where people are going to live very meagerly, and then by the 8th century, they are going to become much more sophisticated, organize themselves into city-states, uh, called poli, which is going to basically be the form that the Greek, classical Greek world will find, will manifest itself. Yes? Well, they believe, yes, they were, but they intermarried with the Mycenaeans. Yeah, well, they, yeah, I guess they were in charge and they didn't do a very good job. Because they found like evidence of like people living in caves and you know no written language at all and very meager existence, uh, so it takes them 500 years uh, to kind of rebound from that and the classical Greek world uh, that we uh, are familiar with emerges. 
uh, in the form of the city-states. These people are going to call themselves the citizens of Hellas, H-E-L-L-A-S, and they are going to see themselves as distinct from the other groups of people around them. It is not going to be until the Persian invasions into Greece around 490 that the Greeks are really going to see themselves as a unified culture. There's a lot of conflict in between the individual city-states uh, for many years. Uh, of course, uh, the Greek culture is going to be uh, a basis for uh, Western ideas. Uh, this was, uh, particularly in Athens in the 5th century, going to be the home of kind of every uh, great Greek thinker you've probably ever heard of, including uh, Socrates, Plato, uh, Cicero, Herodotus, Pythagoras, are all going to live together in Athens in a 100-year period for an extraordinary golden age. Uh, it's going to be here where we're going to see all types of governmental systems are going to be debated uh, and uh, discussed. Uh, we know about this through Plato's writings, who wrote The Republic during this period, who advocated for a democratic form of government. His teacher, Socrates, however, that did not leave us writ a written um, form a favor to benign king. Uh, all of them, however, were deeply aver averse to the kind of autocratic kings that ruled uh, the Middle East and were basically embodied by the Persians, who were the arch enemies of, uh, of the Greeks. Uh, the Greek culture certainly has been idealized. Uh, this was not a perfect world by any means. These are people that held slaves. Also, women had a very uh, secondary role. They were not equals to men. They spent their time secluded in women's quarters within homes and were not allowed any access to public or political life. Very different than the Aegean culture that we looked at from the ancient period. Another interesting aspect about uh, Greek uh, culture is the way in which they believe that intellectual pursuit was complemented by physical exercise, uh, and the physical body was given as much import importance and attention as the mental self. Uh, they believe that the, a balance between these two aspects of human beings uh, created um, an ideal state, and this was emphasized in their humanistic education. Uh, the earliest works of art we find from the, this uh, culture, uh, they're going to emerge in the 8th century. And this is one of these very early objects, the geometric crater from the Diplon Cemetery, which was found in Athens, which is dates to 740 BCE. This was found on the grave of, of an Athenian man who was buried in this year. Uh, it's a fairly large... Uh, crater. A crater is a vessel for mixing water and wine. It's about four and a half feet tall. It currently lives in New York. Uh, and here we see a good example of the geometric style, this kind of early form of Greek art with this kind of highly uh, geometric pattern uh, with a very kind of basic, uh, almost crude-like geometrically formed uh, human uh, individuals. Um, we can see, like the work of Ace, this is divided into clearly readable narrative. Uh, narrative composition is in play with two registers. On top is a geometric meander pattern, typical of the geometric age. You can see this is a key-like forms um, that now that you've seen it, you'll see that that used everywhere. Um, the wide part of the crater, uh, this band here, uh, represents a funeral, presumably, of the deceased man. This is an example of a prothesis, or a lying in state of the dead. And this was typical type of iconography associated with these um, grave markers. Uh, we see the man here is laid out on his funeral bier or bed. Underneath here is an altar in which we see animals placed which will be sacrificed. 
the ancient Greeks did not have a clear conception of death. It was kind of a colorless place. Uh, their emphasis was on the here and now, uh, life as it was lived. Uh, we see here also these figures on either side or here of lifting up uh, the uh, checkerboard cloth. This was actually the death mantle that would have been laid over the deceased figure. And we see them uh, very schematic, right, geometric in form, uh, combined view as the, we see the, uh, you know, the, the, the old formula uh, with the torso in a triangular form seen from the front and the legs seen from the side with that little tiny head and the frontal eye. Uh, we see figures on all sides here. These are mourners, women, female figures that have their hands over their head as if they're pulling out their hair. Uh, these were mourners. Uh, mourners like this uh, were part a usual part of funerary practice, and in fact, in the classical world, you could hire mourners to come uh, and pull their hair out uh, for you. Uh, this was <laughs> something you could do. Uh, in the register below, we're looking at, interestingly, a military uh, company. Uh, this may indicate that this man was uh, in the military or a general or had some kind of affiliation with the military. We see a chariot rider here with um, four horses pulling his cart uh, with these um, large shields uh, that were used uh, by the Greeks at this early uh, point um, in a, in a, a military uh, procession. Uh, the, as you can see here, it's a very schematic view of the body. Silhouettes uh, really seen in this kind of silhouetted form with four, uh, in the profile. Um, another interesting aspect of this crater is the fact that it has no bottom uh, so that one could pour the wine uh, into the crater and it would flow out uh, into the ground below it, assumably uh, for the uh, deceased uh, to uh, enjoy. Um, as I said, the Greeks didn't have any clear uh, understanding of the afterlife, like the Egyptians, it was just very ill-defined, ill uh, and this could be um, this kind of pouring wine to the sea, so some kind of association. Um, so many of these are uh, were found, um, and this is a very good example of the kind of uh, funerary art of, of the geometric period. We don't have any other painting really from this age, so we look really predominantly at uh, pottery for an uh, idea of painting in the ancient world. Uh, look at sculpture during the geometric age. Uh, here is quite primitive looking. This is uh, a hero and centaur that dates to about the same time in solid cast bronze. Also, these very kind of schematic figures. We see here a hero uh, battling a centaur, who is a mythical beast, part man, part horse. Uh, it is believed that this is a representation of Heracles, uh, the hero of the Greek world. Uh, Heracles was the son of Zeus and a mortal woman who um, uh, is going to be uh, a bane of uh, Zeus's wife, Hera, who is wildly jealous of everything he does and all of his many lovers. And he, she takes out her anger on Heracles, uh, basically torturing the poor guy uh, until he goes crazy and murders his own family. Uh, and then he has to go through a whole series of punishments to make atone for his grievous sin of killing his wife and children. Uh, and this is kind of the epic story of uh, Heracles. At one point, he battles a centaur, uh, and we'll see uh, various images of him uh, as we look at Greek art. <clears throat> Notably here, right, uh, something new, uh, certainly, uh, now that we've kind of different than the ancient cultures we've looked at, is that we see these two kind of battling in a nude form. Um, nudity was something we don't see in ancient Egypt or the Near Eastern world. Nudity, however, was something very much praised by the ancient Greeks. This comes uh, and is part of their humanistic worldview and their love of 
uh, the human being and the human body. Uh, Greek athletes in the Olympics participated in the nude, as did warriors who went in the battle fighting in the nude. Uh, and this is kind of interesting and um, part of uh, Greek culture. Uh, we also see hierarchy of scale uh, going on here, where uh, the hero, uh, Heracles, is larger uh, than that of uh, the centaur. And these early um, Greek sculpture are very, very small, okay, um, just a few inches high. It's not going to be long uh, until the Greek world comes in contact with the Eastern world, and we're going to see the influence of the Near East and of Egypt. Uh, and the work that is produced from this exchange is called or Orientalizing Arts. And here are two examples of this early phase of Orientalizing Art. Um, I'm showing you on the left a Corinthian uh, amphora, um, uh, a vessel. Uh, and on the right, uh, another crater, uh, which has evidence of Near Eastern motif. All of a sudden, we see a kind of a larger elements uh, incorporated. We, we lose that you know, minuscule type of bands for larger figures. Uh, and here we see the use of animal forms, uh, including lions that we're seeing on either side here. These are obviously Near Eastern. And also the composite creature, a siren, a half woman, half bird form. Uh, that also is something seen in the Near East. Uh, on the right, the incorporation of the ram motif. Uh, we see them here with the large horns. Uh, we're going to see uh, the uh, a kind of explosion of ceramic uh, innovation in Corinth at this time. Uh, and here we see them using the black figure painting technique uh, early on. Uh, and this is basically when um, uh, a, a slip of uh, clay and water is placed on top of a terracotta um, object and then is fired in a kiln, baked in a kiln, and then the oxidation is going to turn uh, the slip black and the terracotta will have a uh, reddish tone. And this is going to develop here and we're going to see all sorts of innovations uh, in Corinth uh, through, uh, the, um, uh, through the ages. Uh, interesting, at the same time in the 7th century, we're going to see the Greeks found a trading colony with the Egyptians called Nacratus. Uh, and through this trading colony, we're going to see the, the Greeks become exposed to a lot of Egyptian art, particularly stone architecture. And almost immediately, we're going to see the influence in uh, Greek ar art. Uh, here uh, in sculpture, we see it with this uh, extraordinary figure, the Lady of Auxerre, a statue of a goddess that dates to about 650 BCE. Um, this was uh, originally from Crete, and it is believed that, and was it is believed to be the work of a master there named Daedalus, who was Greek but believed to have actually lived and worked in Egypt and then returned home and brought with him uh, an Egyptian aesthetic. And clearly we can see that here uh, in this figure that looks so Egyptian uh, with her bilateral symmetry, the frontality of the work as she looks out at us. Uh, we see uh, similar hair uh, of those Egyptian wigs. Uh, she looks at it, all of her fingers are of the same length as she places them on her chest in the Egyptian style, as well as uh, you know, the absolute frontality of it. Uh, while this looks monumental, it looks like it's really a big um, object, it's actually quite small, only two feet tall. Uh, but what we're going to see is with the exposure of Egyptian art, the scale of Greek art is going to radically increase. And we're going to see, not shortly thereafter, large scale uh, sculpture, life size uh, being produced. Um, 
this uh, young woman, uh, typical of uh, Dadalic art, we see the triangular face uh, form of her head and the kind of flatness to her features, uh, which is kind of a hallmark of uh, th this work. And I'm sorry to say, I think we're already out of time. We didn't get really far into this, but we'll pick it up again uh, next time.